Welcome to Alabama Short Stories, when you're a little behind on your Alabama history. I'm your host, Sean Wright. Cities around Alabama all seem to have an icon that identifies them. Huntsville has the Saturn rocket. Birmingham has Vulcan. Montgomery has the Capitol. And Tuscaloosa and Auburn have stadiums dwarfing their cities. Mobile has an icon as well, the World War II battleship USS Alabama. The USS Alabama in Mobile Bay is one of those must-visit attractions around the state. And if you have been in Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, or Girl Scouts, there's a good chance you've spent at least one night on the ship the way thousands of service members did on active duty. I've spent three or four nights on the USS Alabama when I took both of my sons on Cub Scout trips. Every time we went, we stayed in the bow of the ship. We followed our guides through a large hatch and down steep stairs. We walked around a large curved wall that was part of the forward gun to the very front of the bow. There would be bunks two and three high that we would sleep in overnight. You could see the bow curve on the walls, and there were cylinders that cut through the room, housing the large chains connecting to the anchors. We had adequate bathroom facilities, air conditioning, and mattresses that rested on cots with springs. If not for the snoring of the other adults, it would have been very comfortable. It was a lot like what the sailors went through during wartime, except they did not have air conditioning and the bunk rooms would get very hot. I had inside knowledge of what life was like aboard an active battleship. My grandfather, Marion Ramsey McQueen, was a career Navy man, rising to the rank of Chief Petty Officer. He joined in the 1920s and happened to be on the USS Maryland when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Luckily, he survived and was able to tell me about life aboard a battleship. There were a lot of sailors on a battleship, and they slept in every available space. My grandfather told me that he slept in a hammock. There would be hooks hanging from poles to hang your hammock. Now, when you walk around the USS Alabama, you'll notice poles with hooks on them all over the ship. It looks a little like you could be in a meat locker and almost see sides of beef hanging on the hooks. I believe these hooks are where some sailors hung their hammocks to sleep at night. The hammocks were one size fits all, and I never asked Granddad how he could get his six foot two frame under the small hammocks. Now, the attack on Pearl Harbor decimated the U.S. Pacific Fleet. The battleships were in port, and lucky for us, our aircraft carriers were at sea during the attack. The battleships USS Arizona and USS Oklahoma were sunk in the initial attack and lost. The USS Nevada was refloated and repaired. The USS California and the USS West Virginia sustained damage and sunk into the mud. They were refloated, repaired, and put back into service. My grandfather's ship, the USS Maryland, was lucky enough to be docked between the USS Oklahoma and Ford Island, protecting them from the worst that the Oklahoma had gone through. The Maryland was sent to Puget Sound for repairs and modernization before joining the remaining fleet at the Battle of Midway. Now, many of these ships had been launched 20 years before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Luckily, the newest battleships, the South Dakota class, were being constructed at Navy yards around the U.S., including the USS Alabama. When she entered service, she was deployed to strengthen the British home fleet and protected convoys to the Soviet Union. She transferred to the Pacific in 1943 and was part of the Gilbert and Marshall Islands campaign. She was an escort for a carrier task force and took part in the Mariana and Palau Islands campaign and the Philippines campaign. In 1945, she received a retrofit and made it back for the Battle of Okinawa and attacks on the Japanese mainland. After the Japanese surrendered, she participated in Operation Magic Carpet, bringing over 700 men home from the former war zone. After the war, the USS Alabama was assigned to the Pacific Reserve Fleet until 1962, when she was stricken from the Naval Vessel Register. This was the end of the road for the once proud USS Alabama, or was it? Jimmy Morse was having breakfast and reading the May 1st, 1962 edition of the Mobile Register newspaper when a story caught his eye. The Associated Press was reporting that the South Dakota class of battleships would be sold for scrap, including the USS Alabama. When Morris made it to work at the Tourist and Visitors Department of the Mobile Area Chamber of Commerce, he found Stephen Kroom, chairman of the Chamber's Committee for Preservation of Historic Landmarks, 
already eager to join the fight to save the USS Alabama. They built a team of businessmen who agreed that the battleship should be preserved as a memorial to Alabama citizens who fought here and abroad in World War II. They met with Governor John Patterson, who was in complete agreement. A petition was immediately sent to the Alabama State Legislature, and a joint resolution was passed. The governor put together a fact-finding committee to study the feasibility of bringing the ship to the Port of Mobile. Now, this was not the first battleship to be saved from the scrapyard. The USS North Carolina and USS Texas had been saved and relocated to their home states. Both groups were eager to share their expertise to help save the USS Alabama. While the committee worked, a statewide election was held and George Wallace became Alabama's newest governor. Luckily, he fully supported the actions of committee members and helped to bring the Alabama home. The state of Alabama was fully behind the effort and surprisingly, so was the national government. The only problem was, where was this money going to come from? The Navy was going to give the USS Alabama to the state. The transfer was as is, where is, with no additional cost to the federal government. As is meant the state was getting the ship in the shape it was currently in. And after being mothballed for the past 15 years, it needed some work. Where is meant the state had to move it from the Pacific Reserve Fleet in Puget Sound, outside of Bremerton, Washington, all the way to Mobile Bay. The Navy would be allowed to inspect the USS Alabama annually and make sure she was in fighting shape. A provision was made that should the Navy ever need her, they reserve the right to send her back into active duty status. A lot of work would have to be done to get her into shape. Scraping and repainting every inch of the ship was job one. Now moving the USS Alabama would be no easy task. It was a long journey from Puget Sound to Mobile Bay, and the state would have to pay to get the ship home. With all the help the state government was giving the newly formed Battleship Commission, none was financial. Public fundraising was the only answer. Frank Sanford, chairman of Birmingham-based Liberty National Life Insurance Company, rallied the state's life insurance agents and underwriters. While collecting monthly policy premiums, they asked citizens for donations in a statewide grassroots fundraising campaign. The most impressive part of this fundraising campaign was the children's campaign. Children of Alabama donated almost $100,000 in nickels, dimes, and quarters to save the Alabama. In exchange, Governor Wallace promised those who donated one free ticket to visit the USS Alabama as long as he was in office. A professional fundraising company was hired to help raise money from corporations and make up the difference. In less than six months, $800,000 was raised in all efforts, enough to get the ship moving to Alabama. The Navy executed a transfer document to the state of Alabama, and the battleship set sail. The trip from Puget Sound to Mobile Bay would be 5,600 miles long and travel through the Panama Canal. Two tugs, the Sea Ranger and the Sea Lion, would be tasked with towing the battleship to Alabama. What would seem to be a simple task had its challenges. As the USS Alabama approached Panama around Cape Mala, the tug Sea Lion lost its ability to steer and got tangled up in the heavy tow chain. She rolled over and sank with one crewman lost. One tugboat was not enough to safely haul the USS Alabama through the Panama Canal and then to Mobile. The tug Margaret Walsh joined Sea Ranger about a week later to continue the trip. On August 26, 1964, Panama Canal senior pilot Captain Irving Hay boarded the Alabama to guide her through the canal. A great honor for him. The governor of the Panama Canal Zone had a request. He wanted them to go through the east side lock so that spectators could more easily view the ship. Thousands gathered at each of the locks. After the tragedy in the Pacific, the trip through the locks was uneventful, but a tropical storm approaching the Gulf of Mexico would delay them even more. The Gulf had become churned up due to Tropical Storm Dora, slowing the tugs as they moved towards Mobile. The storm did a lot of damage in Florida, but luckily it turned back towards the Atlantic, leaving Mobile alone to welcome the USS Alabama. After 56 days, on September 14, 1964, the USS Alabama entered Mobile Bay and stopped close to her final destination. She was moored just offshore as she waited for dredging to be completed so she could be towed into her final destination. 
a hand-picked crew of mainly Navy veterans began work seven days a week, stripping, priming, and painting the old gray lady. The interior of the ship had been cleaned and made accessible for the general public to tour. Four months later, the ship was ready for visitors. 2,000 spectators watched as Governor Wallace officially opened the USS Alabama Battleship Memorial Park on January 9, 1965. 18 years to the day that the Alabama had been put into mothballs. Battleship Memorial Park has been a top tourist attraction in Alabama for over 50 years. The park is much different today than it was in 1964. Today, you can visit the USS Drum submarine and an impressive number of military planes. Now, during her career as a museum ship, Alabama has been used as a set for several movies, including Under Siege in 1992 starring Steven Seagal, Tommy Lee Jones, and Gary Busey, and the USS Indianapolis Men of Courage in 2016 starring Nicolas Cage. Now, if you haven't visited the USS Alabama, you need to check that off your list. And if you ever get the chance to spend the night on the USS Alabama, do so. Just one suggestion. Make sure you take some earplugs. I am proud to announce that the book Alabama Short Stories Volume 1 is now available at Amazon.com. It features the first three season stories of the podcast in book form. It's a perfect gift for that friend or family member who just doesn't want to listen to a podcast. It's also great for podcast fans who want pictures with their stories. And it's a perfect gift for that hard-to-buy person in your life. You know who they are. Now get them the book. It's available as paperback, hardback, or Kindle version. Not only will it make your life better, but it will help us to continue to produce this podcast. It's a win-win. You can find a link at alabamashortstories.com or search Alabama Short Stories on Amazon.com. Order yours today.